Hey, good morning, everybody. We're going to get started now. My name is Jeffrey Letwin. I'm with the host committee for the summit. I want to welcome all of you attending in person as well as those who are live streamed, just to make sure you've got the right panel. This is um, panel 5.9, Democracy is a Target of Hate, the Role of Organized Hate Groups in the Events of January 6th. And uh, if you have questions, please note the take the scan of the QR code and submit questions by virtue of the QR code. Um, we're not going to take time with long bios. Everybody's bi I commend you to the program because uh, everybody's full bio is in the program. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our moderator today, Seamus Hughes, the Deputy Director of the Program on Extremism at George Washington University. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, and also thank you for all your hard work uh, putting together this panel and this event. Um, I think we all appreciate um, the efforts of the Eradicate Hate advisors and, and board members who put together a spectacular three-day uh, yeah. panel. Um, so yesterday was kind of an interesting time as we look at this panel. We had um, five more arrests of individuals who were charged with um, January 6 um, crimes that day. In total, we've got something north of 870 individuals from every state in the union except for two. Um, so if you're from Nebraska, you're still holding out. Um, but it's, you know, it was the largest FBI investigation in its history. It, it actually overshadowed 9-11 investigation in terms of manpower. You saw prosecutors moving away from uh, field offices around the country and getting uh, detailed to D.C. in the, one of the largest discoveries of, of information. Um, it also provides a window into organized hate groups whether it be the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers or, or the Three Percenters or a variety of other hate groups that were there. And with this kind of public information in, in the court systems and, uh, and a very active uh, fourth state diving into this, um, we have an opportunity to understand those groups um, better. So we're fortunate today to have four experts um, who know the issue much better than I. Uh, we're going to dive in. They're going to give a, about a three, three... Um, minute opening, um, and then we can open up to questions. Again, just a reminder, if you have a question, please scan it on the QR code. I'll look it up in the nice iPad, and then we'll ask them and go from there. Um, so to start us off, uh, Sam, who is the, Sam Jackson, who is the assistant professor uh, at the University of Al uh, Albany. Thanks, Seamus. Uh, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so with my three minutes this morning, uh, I'm going to try to provide a little bit of a, an introduction into the Oath Keepers organization, for those of you who may not know much about that group that has really been uh, at the center of a lot of investigations and discussions related to uh, the J6 insurrection. So the Oath Keepers organization formed in 2009. Um, it was formed by a guy named Stuart Rhodes, who is currently in federal detention, uh, awaiting trial on seditious conspiracy charges related to the insurrection. Um, the group was organized around this perception that Rhodes and some of his friends had that the government is tyrannical or is rapidly becoming tyrannical, and that those that he views as good patriotic Americans need to be ready to resist that tyranny, possibly with the use of violence. So a little bit different than a lot of the groups that we might have been talking about or thinking about over the past few days, Oath Keepers doesn't organize around a perceived racial identity. Instead, it's really that perception of government tyranny that is their organizing principle. Things started to change a little bit in 2016 as the group sort of coalesced behind Trump and as they found more allies or, or at least um, uncomfortable allies, shall we say, in, in different types of events and conflicts with, with people they perceived as enemies. Um, and currently the group is, is perhaps in a little bit of flux or a state of period of transition as they try to figure out what's next for them. Um, I think it remains to be seen whether the organization will continue in the coming years, um, partially dependent on some of these outstanding trials that folks are facing. Um, but I think there are also some other organizational pressures, as well as this broader movement that is persisting despite some of the organizational difficulties that groups like Oath Keepers have faced since J6. That was exactly three minutes. That was very impressive. Wow. Good work. I'm so proud of myself. Um, <laughs> thank you for the, for the overview. Um, Michael, if I can turn to you. So the, Michael Jensen, who is the senior researcher at the University of Maryland START program, um, to dive in a little bit more on this. Sure, thanks, and, and, and thanks for everyone uh, for uh, coming this morning. Uh, 
Uh, I want to take a step back um, and look, uh, take a broader lens at the presence of extremist groups and movements at the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, but first, I want to walk us back to the initial weeks after the event and, and the narrative that was beginning to form around January 6th at that time. What we began to hear was that the defendants uh, that, that are, have been charged with crimes at the Capitol on that day were largely just regular people that got caught up in the moment that really had no links to extremist groups or movements. Outside of the few high-profile cases of the Oath Keepers stack marching up the steps or the, high, you know, the, the, the publicly known members of the Proud Boys that were there at the Capitol that day, for the most part, these were just kind of ordinary people that were there to hear the president got caught up in, in the mob. Um, and, and this is a narrative that has been pushed since by defense attorneys, by public figures, uh, politicians in Congress, uh, one of whom famously declared that January 6th was nothing more than a tourist visit. Um, and so when this narrative began to appear in the weeks after January 6th, um, I, I was a bit skeptical of it, not because I believe there's, there's no way this could be true. Um, there's no way that, that you know, few of these individuals could have links to extremism. My skepticism was, how do we know that already? I've been studying extremist groups, movements, and individuals who could uh, commit crimes on behalf of these groups for a long time. I've looked at several thousand cases, and what I know is that you often don't learn about the extent of their extremist beliefs and their affiliations until well after the event that brings them into the public discourse. It takes a while to learn about these individuals and their connections. So I was a little bit skeptical that we could be declaring that in just a couple short weeks after uh, January 6th. So I and my team at the Start Center at the University of Maryland, we began to collect information on the backgrounds of these individuals, and it took some time. We had to wait for the information um, um, to really get out there. Uh, but the conclusion that we've reached is that this ordinary people caught up in the moment ar argument really misses not only the prevalence of extremist groups and movements at the Capitol on January 6th, but the fundamental role that they played in coordinating and orchestrating the violence on that day. Um, so to date, uh, my team has identified 301 of the almost 900 defendants um, that had some links to extremist groups or movements. Some of these individuals were members of organized groups. Others were uh, self-identified followers of groups that don't have organizational structures. So if you think about the QAnon conspiracy theory, there's not a process for becoming a member. You promote the, the conspiracy theory's beliefs and you're essentially part of the movement. So 301 of the nearly 900, about you know a third of them. I, I want to talk for just a second about what this this number 33% uh, represents. The, the first thing I want to say is that's a massive number. I know it's not a statistical majority, but that's a huge number. And in fact, it's an unprecedented number. This was um, the, the largest coordination and collective effort on behalf of extremists to commit a single criminal event. I've looked at thousands of these events, and it's rare for three extremists to get together and commit a crime together, uh, let alone 300. Uh, the second thing I want to say about this number is that it's wrong. Um, I know it's wrong, and the reason why is because we're still learning about these individuals and their associations with these groups um, and their movements. This is a number that is sure to grow. And just to give you an example, uh, just last week, um, there was a, a woman and her husband uh, who are defendants um, in the January 6th case uh, that were arrested well over a year ago, but they're finally reaching the end of, the, of their criminal proceedings. Um, and, and up until a week ago, there was never any mention in any news stories about them or any other open sources about any links to extremism. They seem to epitomize the normal people that got caught up in the moment argument. Um, and then last week, the defense and the government submitted their sentencing documents in the case. And buried in the government's sentencing memo is kind of a throwaway line is about how this woman in the weeks leading up to January 6th had linked up with a militia organization and was allowing her property to be used for military style training. Right. And these are the types of links that we're just starting to learn about for cases you know, where arrests were made a year ago. Right? So this, is, this 35% number is, is going to grow. It's not, um, it's not accurate. Um, while you've probably heard of groups like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, Three Percenters, QAnon that were present at the Capitol, it's important to note that we've identified no fewer than 49 extremist groups and movements that had representation at the Capitol on January 6th, and Mike, some which you maybe never heard of. Michael, do you want to throw the slide on? Well, it's a, oh, the slide, yeah, yeah. <coughs> I <forgot> the slide. 
So some of these groups, I'm sure you've, you've, you've probably never heard of groups like uh, the Dixie Defenders and the Genesee County Volunteer Militia. Um, so, you know, this was not just an event that was purely made up of Oath Keepers and Proud Boys. Um, those. So this is a network map that, that I and my team put together showing the individual defendants and their links to extremist groups and movements. Um, and you can kind of visually see um, not only the presence of these organizations, but how well connected uh, the individuals were. Um, overall, I can't say about the, the big groups, there were uh, 82 individuals connected to the Proud Boys, 42 Oath Keepers, 32 individuals who self-identified as three percenters, and, and the one that should make it difficult for all of us to sleep at night, 94 individuals motivated by the QAnon conspiracy theory. More than a tenth of the defendants were there in part because of their beliefs in this very bizarre um, and incorrect conspiracy theory. Uh, collectively, these individuals form 830 connections to each other and to their groups. Um, and as you can see in the network diagram, these are not isolated movements that had no relationships with each other. They were actually well integrated in a network. They were operating in the same spaces. They were sharing ideas with each other. There are individuals on this network map that acted as key bridges between groups and movements that otherwise really shouldn't have um, anything to do with each other, but they acted as the connective tissue that allowed them to share ideas and, and ultimately to coordinate their actions on January 6th. So the last thing I'll say about this is just real quick, why does it matter? Why does it matter that, um, that, you know, we, you know, that we continue to look into the extremist backgrounds of, of these defendants? I think the first thing is that it corrects the history on January 6th, um, and it shows the potential for violence in these movements and mass mobilization um, violence. It also helps counter the misinformation around January 6th that continues to grow, that it was really this kind of spontaneous action um, and it wasn't a coordinated event. But I think more importantly, it reveals what um, we are still dealing with and we, what we will be dealing with um, for, for many decades to come. You know, when January 6th is just a chapter in high school textbooks, we'll still be dealing with uh, this. And that's January 6th um, is the result of the mainstreaming of the ideas that motivate these organizations. Right. Um, so while there are plenty of defendants that are not members of the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers, they're familiar with the ideas that these groups promote and they're in sync with the goals that um, they're trying to achieve and they were trying to achieve on January 6th. Unfortunately, my opinion is that January 6th has not served as a wake up call for everyone. You would hope that an event like that would bring all of us to our senses and say, this is ridiculous. What are we doing? We've, we've got to come together. We've got to move the extreme ideas back to the fringes. And, um, and we can passionately disagree, but we, we do that in a civil way. And what we've really seen is a doubling down on the extreme beliefs um, that, were, that were present at the Capitol on January 6th. So this is a challenge we're going to be dealing with for, for generations. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and, and just if, if it's hard to see the, the chart, I would recommend you go to START's website, <coughs> start.umd.edu, um, which you'd have kind of dive into the various aspects of the connections. Um, yeah. Well, that's the, the benefit of question and answer. We'll dive right into it. Um, okay. Uh, coming up next is, is Oren Siegel, who's the vice president of the Center on Extremism at ADL. Thank you. Uh, I actually want to feed off of this interactivity that we already have. Um, how many people were surprised, <clears throat> excuse me, by what they saw on January 6th? Okay. How many people were surprised by what they saw in Charlottesville in 2017? So it's interesting about both of those cases, I'm, I'm trying to take a step back before January 6th, is that there are a lot of indications in both cases that something was going to happen, right? In Charlottesville, people forget that there were two major neo-Nazi rallies there, not necessarily setting up as practice, but that demonstrated an interest in that particular community, particular statues, the ability to bring white supremacists from different parts of the country. And then I think after two times, then we had this massive incident in Charlottesville. And I think the same thing happened in, in DC on January 6th, where it was shocking, I think it was shocking for all of us, but for those who were really paying attention to what was happening, it really should not have been a surprise. Um, I live in New York, I don't live in DC, but those who live in DC can say, there were a lot of violence um, carried out, directed, designed by many of the groups that you've heard mentioned already in the months before January 6th. And they were motivated by many of the similar narratives that brought people to DC, <clears throat> excuse me, on that day. 
And so we saw, I think it was in uh, December, you had a bunch of white supremacist organizations, Oath Keepers, anti-government extremists, um, a whole set of groups that I think we'll dig into a little bit more, um, showing up because they were concerned about the election being stolen, sort of the stop the steal narrative was already being created, and they were there in a very coordinated fashion, and there was violence in the street. And so the fact that that actually also happened in November, and I'm gonna take us even further back, that we saw many of the groups uh, side by side with the majority of people that were not affiliated with extremists in capitals in Michigan you know, storming capitals during the beginning of the sort of pandemic, right? They were more focused on mask mandates and, you know, closures, but the ability for sort of extremists to come out in full force and organize uh, their efforts targeting government institutions and relying, frankly, on so many Americans who are sympathetic to the narratives, are being you know, brainwashed by these narratives, um, but also have legitimate sort of concerns for their livelihood, was a blueprint that we literally we saw play out for a year prior to January 6th, whether it was in different parts of the country or in DC itself. And so I think the extremists were getting emboldened, and I know this because we were monitoring what they were saying, how they were coordinating their next activity, how they were gonna try to recruit and reach people that may not normally uh, subscribe to their ideological beliefs, but are still sort of like-minded in their concerns about government overreach or, or what have you. Um, and so I think we need to see January 6th as sort of the logical conclusion to what we had been seeing playing out over, you know, months beforehand. And so as we think about, you know, where, what's happening now, where are they going, I think probably the next part of this conversation, we just need to remember what actually brought these folks there. And maybe we have a discussion about what majority means and you know, extremist and non, but the bottom line is these extremist narratives that used to be on the fringes clearly became something that more and more people were embracing and, and resulted on that day. So look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. And I think that's a pretty good segue for Aaron Wilson, who's our senior director at the Human Rights First for Extremism and Human Rights. Thanks so much, Seamus, and to Eradicate Hate for, and to my fellow panelists for having today's important discussion. Uh, so some might ask, why would a human rights organization uh, be looking at this? And at Human Rights First, we believe that what we're calling the anti-democratic far-right extremist movement is a direct threat to the communities we've been working for over 40 years to protect. And for my remarks, I'll also take a little bit of a step back, and instead of focusing on the groups themselves, um, I'll focus on the the broader movement, this movement, this anti-democratic extremist movement that led us to January 6th and what that means for our democracy moving forward. Uh, and this movement is comprised of the violent groups that you've heard um, my colleagues talk about already, Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, Patriot Front, the institutionally focused groups who mainstream these harmful ideologies through rhetoric and legislation, um, as well as a multitude of individuals and networks who have bought into a range of extremist ideologies from QAnon, militia violent extremism, um, and most notably white supremacy, with the ultimate goal of transforming our multiracial, pluralistic uh, society and democratic system of government into one that largely leans authoritarian and is organized according to race, ethnicity, culture, etc. And this movement uses a variety of tactics, some of which have already been talked, talked about, and whether that's physically terrorizing our communities or mainstreaming these policies steeped in xenophobia, racism, bigotry. And this movement thus consists of overlapping actors and entities that are working in coordination, as we saw on January 6th. And what makes this particularly difficult to counter is that it is both mainstream, as my colleagues have talked about, and it is a movement. And I think that's still kind of lost in our public narrative to date. So what was, as Oren just said, once a threat largely posed by fringe actors, now includes politicians, think tanks, mainstream media outlets. And January 6th could not have occurred without the funding and promotion of these various institutional actors. 
So in addition, we also know that for decades, this movement has funded on state and local level democratic institutions. Because in our federated system, these are the policies and structures that have the most impact on our daily lives, um, from school boards to county commissions. And so, for example, we see these tactics ta play out when uh, leaders in border states falsely and illegally declare a migrant invasion in an attempt to leverage our National Guard against immigrants and refugees, thus parodying the very same narratives that were used to inspire the attacks in Buffalo and Pittsburgh. We see this play out when school boards reject um, uh, the anti-racist uh, ideology of the civil rights movement and protest critical race theory. We see this stay out with state. Uh, play, we see this play out with state laws uh, to roll back rights for the LGBTQ plus community, and we see this play out in a host of other ways, including um, a woman's right to bodily autonomy in different states. So, in addition, the movement has been working for decades to degrade trust in our democratic processes and institutions and they're clearly succeeding. So the poll polling shows that Americans have decreasing confidence in our voting processes and in election legitimacy, the bedrock of our democracy. And we see the impact of this in conspiracy theories such as the big lie, and we saw this most notably in the January 6th attack on our Capitol. So in short, democracy is in the movement's crosshairs. We can already see the impacts of this leading up to 2022, 2024, uh, and we are already behind the curve. We've been behind the curve. So if we fail to address it, this movement could dominate our social institutions and our, and our systems of government, thus ending the great American experiment of democracy. Thank you. You can see we're a lot of fun at cocktail parties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a Knicks fan, so you're forever optimist, I guess. Um, maybe I can spur a little bit. So the questions are coming in, although the internet's down. So we're going to see if it pops in. Um, and if not, we'll just go to, to crowd questions and, and um, using your voice, like the old school. Um, but I want to see if we can start a little bit of a debate and conversation, disagreement. I don't know. Let's do one of those things. Um, you know, January 6th, there's, there's some analysts out there that, that would argue that January 6th was a perfect storm, right? You had, um, for lack of a better word, mainstream politicians advocating for people to come there. You had uh, tech companies that are behind the eight ball on stopping um, organizations on their platforms. You had groups that had not, you know, nobody had knocked on the door in years to see how they're doing, uh, able to organize and, and, and rally. And was it a perfect storm, right? Uh, why didn't we see rallies like this on January 20th on uh, the inauguration? Why didn't we see it for Justice for January 6th rally in D.C.? Is January 6th an outlier, or is it going to be the norm? Mike? Yeah, so, you know, in, in, in my uh, view, it's, it's absolutely an outlier, and you should be happy about that. Um, this is, was an unprecedented event, and there were elements of a perfect storm there, but the thing that concerns me the most is what is the alternative to January 6th for these groups and organizations, and what have they learned from the event? So while we're, I think we're very unlikely to see another mass mobilization event bringing thousands of people to the Capitol and then thousands of them storm the building and attack police officers, um, what we are seeing is the hyper-localization of the threats from these organizations. So the lesson they've learned is don't mobilize nationally, mobilize locally, where you could actually have a real impact. Um, so we're seeing unprecedented number of threats against school board members and health board officials. We're seeing these groups show up in their local communities to be an intimidating presence. Um, it's, it's a near guarantee that at the midterms and, and certainly in 2024 that they will be active at polling places um, trying to intimidate individuals. Um, so the alternatives for these groups to January 6th, the lessons learned for them, is to localize their efforts where they can have far more impact. Um, and, and so, yes, while January 6th is an outlier, it doesn't mean that we're out of the woods here in terms of the, the threat that these groups pose. Thanks. Um, Sam, I was wondering. Can I, can I, yeah, no, disagree, please. I, well, I don't I, want to disagree. I mean, I, I actually agree with a lot, a lot of what you said. But I mean, I'm trying to think. Like, is it possible that we will see another mass mobilization event bringing a bunch of people together that ends up in violence? I think the answer is yeah, absolutely. I mean, it doesn't have to be. <clears throat> excuse me. A long night last night. It doesn't have to be a, uh, you know, something that is so explicit where they're calling for violence in the lead up to an event. But we know that many of these events are, are sort of um, 
uh, promote it as something other than we need to go engage in violence. But then you have a whole bunch of extremist groups, including the ones that were there on January 6th, who will try to exploit that. Um, so I think it's very possible, whether it's election related or something else, to have a mass mobilization that turns into serious violence, whether it's in D.C. or some part of the country. Um, I, just, I just wouldn't be surprised by that at this point. I'll, I'll add on to that. Um, I think that some of the actors who are present on J6 might already be preparing to repeat the same thing in 2024. I think we're already seeing more and more political candidates, as well as elected officials, continuing to delegitimize the outcomes of, elect, uh, of elections, when, especially when they lose, maybe exclusively when they lose, conveniently. <laughs> um, so, so I think that J6 was an outlier, and I think that if we see another J6, it will continue to be an outlier. I think some of the things that Mike is pointing to around local, uh, sort of focusing on the local, um, that might well be a lesson learned from J6, but it's also something that a lot of these groups and movements have been doing for years and years. And in fact, the large national organizations are the exception rather than the rule. If you look at the landscape of, of organizations on the far right in the US, there are a lot of hyper-local groups. For example, Three Percenters, it's a movement, it's not a national group. There are lots of hyper-local or, chap or, or state uh, level three percenter groups. Even for a group like Oath Keepers that does have a national organization, there's a lot of autonomy for state and local organizations to decide what they want to do, state and local chapters to decide what they want to do. So I think we're going to continue to see a lot of these local domains being the place where a lot of action happens with occasional flashpoints at the national level. You know, I, I, th I think about that a little bit more in terms of the Oath Keepers, you know, is the veneer off of them, right? Meaning that, um, you know, I mean, you guys just did great work on, on the leaked data of 37,000 Oath Keeper members and not an insignificant number of law enforcement and elected officials in there. Um, but I wonder if they would still join now, right? So, you know, I remember back you know, going to Fort Bragg and seeing an Oath Keeper like poster on the bulletin board because it was just a club of guys who shoot shotguns and drink beer and also hated the government, right? I don't think, uh, I would hope, a soldier's not that naive anymore on this. Um, and so I was wondering if you, th if you think, like, what should we take about the, the effect that there were so many names in that leaked database? And then maybe I can pivot after that. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about the differences between the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys post-January 6th, the resiliency or lack thereof on the organizations. All right, great. And then, so, Aaron, I'm going to ask you how to fix it. <laughs> so, well, so you have the hard one. Got it. So I'll start just with a, a brief description of what the report that, that Seamus mentioned. So uh, two weeks ago, we released a report which um, looked at leaked data of Oath Keeper membership lists from 2009 to 2018. And what we did was literally look through all the email addresses, other information in that leak to try to identify specifically um, people who may be in positions of power. Because as much as I, I do care about accountant and grocery store uh, owner oath keepers, what we really wanted to focus on was who is in law enforcement potentially, who may be in uh, the military, first responders, or potentially elected officials or those running for office. And <clears throat> a result of the six month, hold on, here's a water. Whoa, that was a good one. Okay. <laughs> a result of the six-month investigation revealed 373 law enforcement officers we believe uh, were part of this membership list. Uh, over 1,000 former law enforcement. Over 100 current military we believe were part of the list. 80 elected officials. I mean, this was the Oath Keeper dream. They have tried to recruit intentionally first responders, law enforcement, and military, and according to this data, it looked like they had some success in doing so. Fundamentally undermining our democratic institutions, becoming part of the type of organizations we rely to protect on our, uh, our communities, right? I mean, in a time where our public trust is er eroding already, this was a snapshot that frankly was shocking. Um, at the same time, the data that we looked at ended in 2018. Several Oath Keepers are facing seditious conspiracy charges right now. The, the shine of the Oath Keepers is down. We have not seen, and Sam may be able to test this, as much activity from the Oath Keepers after January 6th. But I don't think that means that this issue 
of extremists in, a, in you know, significant positions of power is done because there's going to be some other name that we haven't thought of, some other grouping, some other ideology that people are going to coalesce around and people are going to be attracted to that. So it may be called, you know, how do you say Oath Keepers in reverse or, you know, whatever. I'm not going to try to predict a name. Um, but the good news is the accountability that we've seen after January 6th has really impacted the Oath Keepers. But I don't think in any way that that means what they represent and efforts to undermine our democratic institutions in any way are something that is in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. Just in case anyone's not depressed enough this morning, <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, I think that ADL report is is super helpful. Um, I, I do think it's probably an undercount of people who have military and law enforcement experience, um, n not least because it's a difficult task to yeah. try to figure out whether Bob Smith is this Bob Smith or that Bob Smith but also because Oath Keepers as an organization has encouraged people over time, hey, we know that, that you might face job repercussions or political repercussions if you sign up using your DOD email address or if you give us your job. So sign up under a pseudonym or don't tell us what your job is. Um, so I think the, the, the numbers might actually be higher if we had a, a, a crystal ball and could see who these people actually are. But at the same time, just like Oren's saying, Oath Keepers is just any of these organizations are part of a broader movement. And what we know about right-wing extremist movements in the U.S. is there's a lot of big egos, there's a lot of infighting, and there's a lot of change over time. Groups dissolve and reform in identical shape or in new shapes. Um, so I, I often find myself being in the weird position of having written a book about one of the biggest groups in this space, but thinking that we need to pay less attention to the specific groups and pay more attention to the broader movements that they're part of. Like, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the difference between Proud Boys and Oath Keepers post-January 6th. Yeah, so it, it, it's a really actually quite fascinating kind of natural experiment of what happens to organizations when they suffer leadership disruptions. Um, in this case, uh, the, the leadership of both these organizations was disrupted because there are both criminal and civil proceedings against them. So Enrique Tario and his top lieutenants are currently in jail facing seditious conspiracy charges, and so is Stuart Rhodes um, and his top lieutenants. So we have two organizations that find themselves in very similar positions where the leadership um, is now facing criminal prosecution and there are civil lawsuits as well um, that are looking to financially um, um, hurt these organizations quite significantly. Um, but what we've seen in the 20 months or so since January 6th is that these organizations have really uh, seemingly gone in very different directions. For the Proud Boys, it's, it's really been business as usual for them. They've been very active since January 6th. Um, it's been hyper-local in terms of their activity, but we see that they are um, showing up with the Patriot Front and marching alongside them at Pride events. They're showing up at school board meetings and health board meetings. They're showing up at abortion demonstrations. And, and according to uh, the SPLC, the number of Proud Boys chapters active in the United States have actually grown since January 6th. So for the Proud Boys, it's a, it's a lot of what we saw throughout the history of the organization. A lot of demonstration activity um, really being run at, at the local level. Um, for the Oath Keepers, it's been relative silence from the organization. Um, so we've seen a couple of public events in which the Oath Keepers made a, a public show. Um, those events were um, organized to support the January 6th defendants. Um, but for the most part, they, they haven't been doing what the Proud Boys have been doing. They're not showing up in large numbers um, at, at events. And so the question becomes, well, how much of that is a result of a strategic decision made by the organization to lay low, let, let the heat go away a bit, and then, and then let these criminal proceedings work their way out and then we reconstitute and, 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 um, and start to reorganize? Or how much of it actually is an effect of the fact that they are lacking their leadership right now? You know, how much power was actually concentrated in Rhodes and his top lieutenants, and how much say did they actually have over the wider organization and what it did? Um, and this could be some evidence that the group right now is, is struggling right now with not only um, uh, their identity a bit, but what to do next without the, the leadership in, in place. But as, as Sam and Oren uh, have already mentioned, at, at the end of the day, 
If January 6th is the death sentence for the Oath Keepers, it's not the death sentence for the ideas behind the organization. The Oath Keepers are actually not terribly creative in their ideas. These are borrowed ideas for the most part, right? This belief that there's a tyrannical government that's partnering with foreign enemies in the United Nations to take away your guns and put you in camps, um, that, that's not really all that new. Um, and those ideas are the things that uh, January 6th and the, the prosecution of the defendants, unfortunately, is unlikely to defeat. Thanks. You know, Aaron, the, the benefit of me being in academia is I can admire the problem, but I don't actually have to fix it, right? Um, and you're an organization that does a little bit of fixing. And so I was wondering if you could talk, what should we do about this? I mean, what's the response to January 6th? Well, that's a big question. Mm -hmm. uh, can I tell you first about what I think some of the problems are Absolutely. with our response? Uh, so I think there's a real failure to see this as both this movement that we've all been talking about. Instead, there's a, there's a hyper focus on, on the groups themselves. Uh, and there's a real failure to see this as being mainstreamed, which then when you talk to federal government or state government, their focus then is on these, is on these violent groups, right? And, and there are legal reasons why that is. But in addition, we have to be thinking about what are the preventative measures or what can we actually do to, to at least mitigate the, the growth of this larger movement. But until we see this as a movement that is also propped up by all of these mainstream networks, we're never going to be able to get our, to get our arms around this. Um, so I think we also need to be focusing on not just these violent tactics, but these cultural and institutional tactics that various elements of, of the movement utilize. So when we think about prevention, um, so far, a lot of the discussion that I'm hearing around pre prevention, at least coming from government, uh, has a very, like, 2010 kind of feel to it. They're applying kind of old school uh, problem solving tactics to, to a different threat. Um, this isn't Hezbollah in the U.S. This isn't ISIS in the U.S. This is a coordinated mainstream movement. Um, so we really have to think about this in prevention in a different ways, in, in a few different ways. And there are some things that we can do, right? We need to be supporting our state and local democratic processes. We need to be paying more attention to this. We need to create public, public awareness around what these tactics are. We need leadership to call out uh, this mainstreaming when it occurs. Right? You can never underestimate the value of a leader instead of contributing to something, actually saying this isn't right, this is part of this extremist movement, right? We also need to recognize what I call the legacy of hate in our country because, uh, because systemic hate, systemic racism, all of these horrific things that are still part and parcel of our country uh, lend legitimacy to these broader narratives. And then I think lastly, we do need to focus on, on, these mainstreaming net, on these mainstreaming networks and what we can do to undermine them. And that will take more of, not to be too cliche here, but a whole of society approach. I, government can't do all of that. And that we really need to all uh, be paying attention to the different things we can do to protect our democratic institutions and to increase public trust in these democratic institutions. Thank you. Um, there are a few questions coming in from the crowd. This is why I like you guys. Uh, and so if you have more questions, again, the QR code. Um, there's a question here that says, it seems looking back on events like 9-11, January 6th, and many others, it's always possible to connect the dots. It explains how the events take place and what could have been done to avoid it. Where did we drop the ball on the lead up to January 6th? What did we miss? Or did we not have the systems in place to deal with it? To you, Orrin. <laughs> You're looking at me. Yep. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm good now, by the way, bro, less friction for your ears. Um, so where do we drop the ball? I, I think we drop the ball um, in the sense that we are still not recognizing that a lot of the narratives um, and ideas that we know animate violence, a lot of the spaces where these ideas uh, are incubated um, in online spaces people are not taking the responsibility to create that friction to make that more difficult to get out, yeah. right? I mean, so I don't think like it's just, oh, government should have had a whole, law enforcement should have had a whole bunch more people, you know, on the ground on January 6th. That's, that's a little too late. We should have been, you know, dealing with platforms that are enabling the spread of incitement to violence against not just people but our institutions on a regular basis as a steady diet to many of the people who showed up, right? I mean, that's where a ball was dropped. Not understanding or not having, uh, uh, I don't know, a, uh, 
concrete enough response to people in positions of power who are normalizing the ideas that are leading people to engage in violence. That's where we drop the ball. And so, you know, again, <clears throat> not to take the whole of society sort of language and just say everybody messed up, because um, I think the people who did it are ultimately responsible. Um, but I think we have a lack of imagination in this country. That's why when I hear that, man, maybe it was an outlier or, you know, maybe there's multiple outliers. It, that's not an outlier anymore. Like, we need to have an imagination that says this will likely happen again unless we address all these things that we're talking about. So I think, frankly, everybody dropped the ball. I think there might be another way to look at it as well. Um, as Orrin mentioned earlier, people who are studying and analyzing and, and monitoring this kind of stuff were not at all surprised by J6. And we saw intelligence agencies and law enforcement pointing it out ahead of, of time as well. And decision makers, from my perspective, seem to say, eh, I don't care. I'm, I'm not going to take action against this. And in some cases, that might be because of who elected officials were at the time. In some cases, I think it might be because coming back to this idea of mainstreaming once again, uh, some of the institutions of security in our country find a lot of cultural resonance with these extremist movements. They see themselves in these extremist movements and they think, people like me, we would never attack the Capitol. We would never attack democracy. So I, I think um, some of these security institutions and agencies have started to think more about extremism inside their own organizations since J6, but they need to do so more and they need to have more institutions in place, more policies, more guidance that don't just rely on norms. We've relied too much on norms because norms have worked for us in the past in this country. And what we saw in, in J6 and even in the years before that was that norms were no longer serving us the way they had before. So maybe we need more rigid safe, uh, safe rails, guardrails. And it's actually brings up another question, which probably is, is best for you, Mike, is you know, how important is January 6th in the folklore? You know, are we talking like a Ruby Ridge type of moment where you know, the argument that, that far-right extremists would say is you know, that was government overreach and this was that. And when you look at a January 6th prosecution and you look at their messaging now, it seems like you're only prosecuting us. This is the largest investigation in the history. You, know, you missed the, the riots in the summer of 2020 or whatever. What about some they want to do that day? Yeah. Um, so how important is January 6th? Not necessarily the day itself, but the response to the day itself. Well, I, I, I'd argue that, that both are actually potentially very important, the day itself and the narrative that has the folklore that has developed around it. The day itself is, you, you have to amend, you amend this was a very large gathering of extremists, many of whom, if not most of whom, really had no prior interactions with each other. And we've seen historically that big events like this can actually serve as a breeding ground for the formation of relationships that then later on cause problems. So if you look at the Bundy standoff in Nevada, there were a bunch of people coming together at that event who didn't know each other, but then formed connections there and later on um, together caused problems. And so January 6th could serve as that type of, of meeting place um, where uh, in individuals made connections that then we'll be dealing with later on down the road. But in terms of the folklore, I think that, yeah, that's the real danger here, is um, how um, uh, not, not only these groups perceive the event, but how those that are perhaps sympathetic to their ideology view the event. Um, and so one of the reasons why I think it's so important to correct the history of that day and to be very clear about what actually happened is its way of combating this rewriting of history around January 6th, that this is, this is not the largest criminal event um, in U.S. Hi history. This is the largest example of government overreach and political persecution in U.S. history, right? And that's the narrative that um, these groups are spinning, that their followers are spinning, is that these are now political prisoners that really, um, you know, we're, we're just there exercising their constitutional rights, and this is an example of what happens when you let the federal government infringe on your constitutionally protected rights, is, is you get thrown in jail, you get criminally prosecuted. And unfortunately, what we've seen um, is that that narrative is not nearly as fringe as it needs to be. It actually has quite a bit of support among mainstream 
uh, political actors. Um, so, you know, in Congress and, and in other places of, of power, we hear this narrative that this is this is political persecution. Um, and absolutely, these groups will build this into their narratives to recruit others, um, as they did with Waco and Ruby Ridge and, and, and everything else. Um, and so January 6th, if we don't continue to fight back against the misinformation around the event, can become uh, part of the mobilizing narrative for these groups moving forward. And one of the concerns, you know, as you see a, a lack of trust in government, a lack of trust in media, that everyone's in their own echo chamber now. So their truth is whatever they think the truth is. Um, yeah. And trying to get into that world is a little bit harder, um, which is a good segue to a, a good question from the audience, much better than mine, which is um, this question of takedown versus um, keeping up the content, right? So if you, if you, a mainstream platform like Facebook or Google or things like that, if they did a heavy crackdown of these groups and took them off their platforms, they're going to end up somewhere. And the places they end up tend to be slightly better in encryption, uh, slightly less moderated, uh, no dissenting voices whatsoever. And so can someone on the panel who's very brave um, weigh the, the cost-benefit analysis of takedown versus the potential to keep up? Uh, sure, I'll start. Yeah. And then, and then the rest of yes. you can jump in. I mean, it's it's it's. I think I think it's I think it's very dangerous when you create these echo chambers, right? And so the less exposure to it, the less mainstreaming of it, the better. So I am I am all for this being this dialogue being relegated to the fringes of even the online space, uh, it, because that will happen. It's not like it goes down and it goes away. It does go to other places, right? But rather than this broad mainstreaming, because I actually see that as the greatest threat. Um, and I think you know we really need to hold social media companies accountable. Um, they Every single time, they choose profit over public safety. We've seen this for decades. It doesn't matter if it's ISIS or if it's these movements. They always choose profits over public safety. Or they say they can't do it because it's just too hard. Well, then you look at what Europe started to do in finding them, and magically, they all of a sudden could remove this stuff. And I think it's safe to say this isn't a freedom of speech issue. This is a terms of service issue. And if we, you know, all, all these big platforms, they have terms of service. And and, and the user expects to be, to some extent, stay safe to a, to a certain extent. Um, and, and they are not upholding that. So I think these social media platforms need to abide by their own terms of service and allow for a safe environment and push this stuff off. Yeah. Or maybe dive in a little bit more on this, too. Yeah. Uh, and like, you know, you look at the, the question of radicalization pool. So uh, if they're on mainstream platforms, the radicalization pool is larger. You're able to get the fence sitters and encounter people. If they move to encrypted platforms, the mobilization pool, the radicalization pool shrinks, but the mobilization of violence gets deeper, meaning that they're not hearing any dissenting voices on this. Right. Agree, disagree, what? So I, I, I'll be honest, my, my feelings about this have evolved over time. Um, granted, I was a sort of Neanderthal level at the beginning, um, but I think what you said is exactly right. The less that these narratives have reach, meaning not on the bigger platforms that anybody can access, the better. The whole idea of, well, but then you're sort of putting them into an echo chamber and that automatically means they're going to be more violent. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Because when you reach that many people and have less control, you have January 6th. That was all on, open for anybody to see, very mainstream. And so the, the risk is still on both spaces. And I'd rather limit the amount of reach that these ideas have. So I think ultimately, I also listen to the extremists themselves. That's what we do. And they are very, very upset when they get taken down. They are very much talking about, we can't reach as many people. There are some you know, actors who like, just do not have a following and do not have impact anymore because they were sent to the telegrams and the you know, 4chans and they couldn't mobilize in the same way that these big platforms enabled them. So I listen to what the extremists say. And if they're saying that this is hurting them, I actually believe it. Also, I don't think if I could just add to yeah. that as well, I don't I don't I think there's a false conception that there are dissenting voices. Uh, people are it doesn't even matter if you're if you're talking about what color sweater you like to wear. Nowadays, people are so scared to have a dissenting voice on a social media platform. So especially when you get to these spaces, I think it's usually just supporters. 
If I can uh, self-promote, um, a couple of years ago, I tried to think through some of these complications around takedowns and moderation because I felt like the, the discussion was too surface level. Um, so if, if you're interested in the non-data-driven ramblings of a crazy person, send me an email and I'll, I'll send you that paper. But I think one of the other things that we have to keep in mind when we're thinking about takedowns is it's not just about affecting the extremists who are engaged in the action. There are people on the platforms who are the recipients of hate and harassment and doxing and other things. So not only does a takedown mean that you're removing access for some of these extremists to big platforms where they have big audiences, you're also removing their ability to harass people. And I think that's really important to keep in mind as well. Mike, are we asking the wrong question of, the, of this panel? So, you know, organized groups, um, they seem scary because they're all hanging out together, training, they all know each other. But if you look at the attacks that have happened in this country, in recent memory, whether it be here at Squirrel Hill or Buffalo, they tend to be individuals kind of drawn to an ideology, however blended it may be, but not necessarily kind of true members of the Oath Keepers or the Proud Boys. So if you're law enforcement, should you be spending your time on the organized groups? Uh, you, you should be spending your time understanding the, the ecosystem and, and really how processes of radicalization have evolved uh, in this country and around the world, because uh, you're absolutely correct. At, at one time, the extremist landscape was dominated by groups that were hierarchically organized, that had face-to-face -face membership meetings, and there were prescribed roles for individuals in these groups. And the, the, the key thing that would happen in these organizations is that there was a gatekeeping effect. Um, that was that was around. Um, so not only did these groups uh, exert some uh, authority over who could join, who could be a member of the organization, but they also moderated behaviors because ultimately for a leader of an organized hierarchical group, it's actually very bad for your members to go out and commit a mass casualty crime, right? That brings unwanted law enforcement attention on the group. Um, it brings negative publicity to the organization. And for individuals that are at the top of these groups, you have to remember that in many ways, a lot of this is a big scam to enrich themselves, right? And, and to increase their own status. Um, so that's very, very bad. So they'd moderate behavior. But what we've seen over the last decade plus um, is that there's been a shift from the gatekeepers of hierarchical organizations to the enablers of loosely affiliated movements that are largely found in online communities. Um, and so you get the exact opposite effect in these online communities. Instead of gatekeeping or moderating behavior, um, you have people encouraging one-upsmanship, right? So it's a game. Right? There's the gamification of it. Um, and so the way to be um, the next big thing in online communities is to do better than the last guy. Um, and the lessons that have been shown to these individuals is that you don't need organizational support to do that. There's really actually very few benefits the organization provides you in terms of being incredibly lethal and deadly. Um, it's, it's just not that hard um, to be an impactful terrorist, right? You need access to a firearm, they're everywhere, or you need access to a vehicle or a knife, uh, you know, and, uh, and a crowd of people. And you can, you can be, um, you know, devastating in your behavior. Um, and so what, we, what we're seeing is that these individuals that are on the fringes of these groups that are flirting with their ideas in these online spaces where there isn't a gatekeeping effect are the ones that are mobilizing, usually alone, um, and are the ones that have been responsible for the majority of the highly lethal attacks um, in this country. So I think you have to understand the ecosystem and the ideas, but you also have to understand the dynamics of mobilization and radicalization. So we have a, a few more questions from the crowd. One of them is, you know, if you look at um, the DC jail, you have something called the Patriot Wing, which is you know, January 6th defendants who um, do not believe they did anything wrong that day. They do the national anthem twice a day. They have a newsletter. They organize pretty well. It's kind of the old school um, Al Qaeda days of radicalization in prison. And so the question from, from the audience is, are we prepared to deal with convicted January 6th part participants' eventual reentry to society? Who should be there to assist their reintegration, monitor their reengagement with extremist groups? I think the answer is no, but you guys can tell me whether I'm wrong <laughs> on this. 
That's a, that's a problem that extends well beyond January 6th, is that as a country, we're generally not prepared to deal with the reentry of, of any extremist offenders, not just yep. uh, January 6th offenders. But in the case of January 6th, we do, we do have some evidence of reentry at this point. You know, a lot of, of the, the vast majority of the cases that have been adjudicated to this point have not resulted in lengthy prison sentences. And so these individuals have um, reentered their communities. Um, and, and so we have actually seen, there was just a, a, a report that came out a few days ago about um, you know, a, a concerning level of criminal behavior that these individuals that have been um, released or, or never spent any time in jail that have been engaged. It's mostly non-ideological crime, but there has been a lot of reoffending um, in this J6 population. Um, it remains to be seen um, you know, what the result is for the hardcore, the, the, the patriot wing of the D.C. jail. Um, I imagine, you know, the, the idea here is you isolate them so they don't radicalize the general population of the jail, um, but certainly they can continue to re-radicalize um, e each other. But I think across the board what we've, what we've largely seen with this defendant group is because there is still so much um, political support for them um, in this idea that they did nothing wrong, that while many of them express some remorse at the day of sentencing, they immediately backtrack on that after that's over um, and, and talk about how, the, how proud they are that they were there that day um, and, and how it's the most important thing they've done. Um, so, yeah, this is a population that, uh, you know, some of which could cause problems for years to come. Yeah, I, James, can I, can I just say real quick, also, <clears throat> in America, you can kind of be as hateful as you want to be. I mean, the narratives that we know are motivating people to these actions, I mean, how are we going to stop it when these are people's opinions that we know are damaging? So we're trying to win like hearts and minds, not stop somebody from their ability to say what they believe as satanic as they want to be. I think that's the big challenge here. Yeah, and I, if you look at, at extremism data in terms of recidivism uh, for extremists, it tends to be lower than the general population of criminal um, recidivism. The difference being that if you joined ISIS and get out of jail, you have a scarlet letter on you when you go back in your community, right? Nobody really wants to hang out with you. January 6th, I'm not sure that scarlet letter works when you go back home. Um, I don't think it exists in it. We, we have time for one more question before uh, I get yelled at and kicked out of here. Um, there is a question of how concerned should we be about November, about the next election? We've seen a rise in the number of, of threats against public officials and elected officials. You know, are we getting to another moment? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, we've seen... Uh, members of extremist organizations talk about how they should be poll workers so that they can interfere, not, not their words, but so they can interfere with uh, polling places and, and electoral integrity. Um, we've seen them running for office. Uh, we, we see just lots of signs that, that certainly don't make me comfortable. I mean, when, when an extremist candidate loses their primary and, and suddenly decides that the person who won is a pedophile in a deep state um, agent who everyone knows I actually won, but but the deep state wouldn't let me win. If they're saying that against their the fellow members of their political party, just wait until November when they're running against someone who they've long been decrying as evil and the enemy and the other. Okay. Well, listen, I don't want to end on a depressing note. Uh, so let me let me put it around together. There is some, uh, obviously, the house seems to be on fire, but there is some firefighters in the room. I mean, you know, we've got 500 people at this conference and organizations from around the country, around the world, in fact. Um, towns like Pittsburgh and Buffalo have rallied together to say enough is enough. Um, so we will keep tracking this. Uh, we will keep um, informing the public as best we possibly can, uh, and we will hope that our efforts together and collectively um, have some sort of level of dent um, in the issue. So if everyone could join me in, in thanking our panelists for the discussion.